Welcome to our regular trustee meeting for today, Monday, February 28th at 5.04 p.m. We, uh, all those that are able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. We have an agenda in front of us. Are there any additions or amendments? <coughs> Hearing none, I'll, I'll take a motion, please. I make a motion to approve the agenda for the February 28, 2022 meeting as presented. Second. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Crutch? Yes. Trustee Walls? Yes. Thank you. <coughs> I'll make a motion to approve the general ledger report in the amount of $336,060.01 for the 223-2022 payroll. Second. Trustee Crutch? Yes. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Wall? Yes. I make a motion to accept the payments listing reports in the amount of $700,830.49 for warrants through 224-22. Second. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Kretz? Yes. Trustee Wallace? Yes. We have minutes on the February 14, 2022 regular trustee meeting. Are there any changes or corrections? Hearing none. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the regular meeting on February 14, 2022. Second. Trustee Kretz? Yes. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Wallace? Yes. Thank you. This is the portion of our meeting where we have citizens that are, would like to speak. We would uh, have you come up and sign in. Seeing no <coughs> citizens that want to speak, we're going to move on to our pre-scheduled speakers. Thank you, Board. Uh, first uh, pre-scheduled speakers on your screen is uh, Ted Sumner from uh, Huntington. Uh, give us a presentation regarding our investments. Right. Hello, everybody. I, I couldn't tell if you could see me on the screen or not, so okay. I'm glad you said that. Um, appreciate you having me. I'll make this um, relatively brief. Um, you know, you're limited as to what you can invest in as a public entity in the state of Ohio uh, to the most conservative of investments. But, um, you know, we've been through 2008 and then the COVID pandemic, um, which brought interest rates down to zero. And so the object during that market is to get as much interest income as you can um, on your investments, you know, even when the rest, uh, rest of your options are pretty near zero. Um, I've done a quick analysis of the, of the uh, eight plus million dollars that we have invested. Uh, you currently are generating 40 basis points on average, weighted average of your investments and roughly a 20 month average maturity. So. <clears throat> Ryan and I have been making a consistent effort to kind of shorten up whatever we invest in um, with the hope that interest rates come up at, at some point. Uh, we're finally at that point. The Fed is expected to raise the Fed funds rate next month and raise it fairly quickly over the course of this year. The market's pricing in four to six Fed rate hikes, which what that means to you is that's going to directly impact short-term interest rates, um, the rates that you can get on bonds, commercial paper, and CDs. So that's all good news for short-term fixed income investors. Um, if you look at the current two-year treasury rate, which is a very good benchmark for where uh, the Fed funds rate is going, it's at 1.4%. So um, if you look at the Fed funds futures market, it's also pricing in right around that same level through the year end. So, you know, that means the Fed is going to raise rates by over 1%, maybe 1% to 1.5%. Um, that, you know, what that does is that's, that kind of slows the economy down, but for the purposes of you as an investor, um, you know, that means higher rates and, uh, and, and that's, and that's a good thing. It's, uh, it's, you know, we've been waiting, we've been waiting a while for this. Um, the only thing that would slow down the Fed from raising the rates as fast as possible is, you know, we have, uh, this Ukrainian war, uh, Russian war going on right now, um, that could make the Fed act uh, you know, maybe with a little more deliberation, uh, but still everything we're seeing in the market right now 
uh, says that uh, interest rates are going up. So good news, we've, we've positioned your portfolio to where in the next year, in 2022, uh, of the money of the, of the roughly $8 million, 2.7 million of that's gonna roll over or mature in 2022 in the next 10 months. So that is very good, uh, good news and we did that on purpose to you know, make sure that you know, her hoping that interest rates would eventually be higher, keeping whatever we were doing on the shorter end. Uh, you have roughly $2.2 million uh, in, invested that's gonna come due or mature in 2023. And like I said, you know, on average, everything that you invested in is only uh, at most, you know, right at the average is 20 months, so not even two years. So, you know, did a good job of shorting it up when interest rates were low while still getting you some interest on your money. Uh, and then hopefully be able to put everything back to work, you know, somewhere close to 1% or more, which is uh, really you know, what most can hope for on, on investments like government bonds and FDIC insured CDs. Um, that's really the bulk of what, you know, um, I, I think I wanted to address. I sent a bit a snapshot that just shows a breakdown of portfolio. Uh, sometimes the analysis that I get that I download from from work is not the easiest to read. But the bottom line is, you have ten million dollars worth of government bonds, two point two million dollars in commercial paper, uh, which has a maximum maturity of nine months, and then you r roughly four million dollars in FDIC insured CDs. Um, you know, and I think what the the real positive is that we, you know, on average everything you own is, you know, maturing in twenty months. So um, I think. Uh, concerted efforts to keep everything invested, but keep it short. And now, you know, hopefully everything will roll over and, and much higher rates to come. Does uh, anybody have any questions for me? Any questions? I had none. No, uh, we, think we appreciate uh, the work you've done and uh, keeping us essentially in a position where we can respond. Uh, so when, it, when obviously the market allows us to. So appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Summer. Thank you. We'll sign off. Have a good evening. You too. You too. <coughs> good evening, board. Good evening. Thank you for having us. Um, we worked together, did a, a slideshow for the Champlain Tower collapse in June and July of 2021 that with the Ohio Task Force One, Brian and myself um, responded to for, uh, I want to say it was just at 16 to 17 days. Um, it was a tragic event and it was closely related to the 9-11 attack in the history of collapses. Uh, that's the closest that they've come to a... a uh, an event like that since. Um, so uh, we put a slideshow together just to give you a glimpse of what what we encountered, what we went through on our way down there, um, different things like that. You can push them out. Oh, there we go. So um, on day one, um, we this is obviously a swearing in. We become FEMA employees at that time. We convert over. I'm sure you guys are aware of that. We do that whenever even on um, uh, hurricane deployments, same thing. Um, little picture. I tried to go through, we have hundreds of pictures, tried to go through and get some good pictures. These are the best ones I have for the staging and convoy of our new warehouse at the uh, old Emory plant at the airport, the Emory warehouse, used to be the Emory warehouse. Uh, let's see, so one of the requirements for us uh, while we were down there, we were to wear N95s the whole time, whether we were in in the um, apparatus, the pickup trucks, the buses, the trucks, anything, we were to wear N95. So on our way down there, they, they warned us of that and we ended up fit testing. And as you can see, we, we fit tested. The, the picture on the left is a legitimate picture of fit testing for N95s. They put a plastic bag over your, over your head um, and then there's some uh, smell good stuff that they, they push up there and you either smell it or you don't. So. Um, and then we did it. We we did it throughout that the was a one time thing. You didn't have yeah. to wear that. <laughs> no, 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 no. And uh, and so they when we stopped at a couple different rest stops, they um, they they had us finish that out. But yeah, the 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 mask, the bag is for the testing procedure. Um, 
I want I don't recall. Can you recall how long it took us to get down there? I don't recall. No. It was a period of time. What was nice about it was that when we got down there, we were told that this was going to be our housing um, for the for the time being. The cruise ships were in port. Um, they offered up three different cruise ships um, for all the teams that were down there. They could stay in port, not be fined the, the port fines because they were going to be able to do renovations. So the, the um, ship we were on, it was doing renovations the whole time we were there. Uh, very accommodating. Help was very nice. And, and as you can see, that's myself and Lieutenant Hedrick and then one of our squad members. Uh, in masks in port there so yeah we actually had to go through customs to get on the ship <laughs> yeah you know it was there every time every day twice you would you would leave and or you would go through and come back as you were going through a like tsa every day we'd come back to get on the ship um so the very first day this is what we were uh confronted with that's the half of the building that was still standing um, up until about three days into us being down there. And then all the rubble there in the front, those are floors, uh, all 13 floors. A uh, refrigerator, if you would find a refrigerator, it would literally be about that thick. You wouldn't even recognize it as a refrigerator. Ovens, microwaves, everything. Um, two to three days in, they decided that this building, so we have a building on the Bravo side and on the Char or the Delta side, and they, they had engineers, structural engineers, aiming lasers at these buildings in different points to see if the building was moving. One, when we were working on the pile, but two, just the wind, you know, what kind of effect it had on the, on the building. So uh, two to three days into it, the, the engineers said that, that needed to come down because we weren't going to be able to work in what a 50 60 foot span of that building so and not to mention just the other materials that were hanging on yeah, i think i have a tower that was up there yeah. there would sporadically be pieces that would would fall. fall so we couldn't get close to that building i think 30 40 foot away they actually spray painted a line across the floor and once we got to that area and um, removed all the debris they'd spray paint another line so we wouldn't get too close just in case something would happen so here's some aerial views of of it, it they're kind of small um, but these are early on in the in the event I uh, wish I could zoom in on this picture here is the one that uh, Lieutenant Hedrick's talking about you see in here there's still a bed right there there were air conditioned units there were rooftop units just hanging and, and the wires were, were what were holding it. Um, and you can see the size of this, this building. So it came down like this, and the building was there. And it, as it came down, as it collapsed, it collapsed and twisted. And I'm sure you guys have, have news articles and different updates on, on whatever platform, but it, it came down and twisted. And there were videos out there of people that live in the towers that were videoing it 5, 10, 15 minutes before it collapsed, uh, different things, and they were all uh, red flags, if you will, of, hey, let, let's get out of here, but unfortunately, a lot of them didn't. Uh, so this is the, the pool for the towers, um, and then all of this area was parking garage. So it all kind of came down into a parking garage. You'll see a couple pictures of, of, of that here in a second. But they ended up moving these cars and just putting them in the pool. But this pool was a big factor in the, not necessarily the collapse, but people were, they were saying that the pool's emptying, the pool's emptying. And, and, and so that was one of the, the early detections of it. Um, two days in, these guys here, the demolition crew, uh, they're, as you can see, this is, this is the area that's collapsed. This floor isn't really stable. Um, two, three days into it, they're telling us that they're going to demolish this building. And we got guys in there. And on this next picture, you'll see. But they're running around all in here. It's their job, crazy as it is. 
they were driving skid loaders, bobcats, all along in there, running back and forth, doing whatever they were doing, um, getting ready to take down these pillars. We were like, oh, we're going to have to. There's a guy drilling holes. So they were trying to set detonation charges in these pillars all along the bottom portion of the, of the, um, the building that was still intact. Crazy. Like, we, we didn't even know. We were thinking we were going to have to go in and dig those guys out. But here's a, here's a glimpse of the inside of that, of that parking garage in there. Um, I can't remember the amount of cars that were in there. I don't, there were multiple. So here's kind of a, um, uh, a gl like a, a look at the, the span of the, of the debris field. Uh, the building that's still standing was over here. And I think this was after they demolished that building. Uh, a lot of that building that was still standing when they demolished it, it came straight down, but it kind of pushed towards the street side on the other side of the, of the structure. It just seemed like piles of debris would be moved from here to here to here to here, and then they would move it out. So it was, we, we got hands-on piles of debris over and over again. Uh, engineers, the, uh, the people in charge, they wanted to keep all these pillars. They were numbering these pillars, trying to remember the location of where they were. They had rebar, like one, one and a half inch rebar um, that we would just pull right out of concrete like it wasn't even sticking in there. That was all for their after, for their investigation purposes. Equipment-wise, I just wanted to give you an idea of the type of equipment and the size. So we had two large cranes that were uh, 120-ton, and they were capable of picking up 60 to 70-ton pieces of equipment at a 80, like an 80 to 90 foot rate away. So, you know, the, the back of these, t these cranes here, they had um, upwards of 100,000 pounds of counterweight. Pretty impressive, the amount of equipment and people that they had here. Miami, what was it, Florida 1, Florida 2, utilized state assets and FEMA. Uh, they were the incident command for the whole time and they, they split it up to where Miami, Dade, and Miami were daytime and nighttime. They were broke off into 12-hour shifts. Uh, Brian and I, was, we were lucky enough to be daytime, noon to midnight, or unlucky enough, because so, it was hot. Yeah, so we went, our operational periods were a little bit different than normal. We went from noon to midnight and then midnight to noon and that was due to the heat. I mean, it was in the summer, the heat index was over 100, so not one operational period was dealing with the heat the whole time. Um, but, so we would get, we would leave the cruise ship at nine in the morning, get out there, get our debrief, and then get our assignment and start working. We would work for 12 hours, we'd be off the pile around midnight, get back to the cruise ship at one, get somewhat cleaned up, get, make sure your stuff's squared away, get into bed at two, and then you know, turn around and wake up at six to start over again. So the next two pictures are um, of the floor plan. So we, all, we, we received floor plan ideas, and you can see that floor three is the same as floor 12. <clears throat> so the layout was the exact same kind of had an idea of where bedrooms were, where living rooms, bathrooms, and that. The problem, as I said before, was there were people out videoing it at the time of the collapse. You know, it was a, a hot time. It was a, a, you know, it was a Saturday night, if I'm not mistaken, Friday night or Saturday night. So, you know, Miami, Surfside, they were coming back from wherever. Not a lot of people were in the actual places that they thought they were going to be. They were in the the foyers, the hallways, running out the balconies, things like that. So um, I didn't really put in here anything about the Israeli defense team that they had. They had a group of people that came from Israel because this was a highly, um, the, the building housed prominent Jewish people from Israel. And um, so they brought this Israeli team over and they through interviews, through other just basic talk, they found out where everybody was, who was on what floor, who was in what 
uh, apartment, condo, and, and they would say, you need to dig down three floors to get to this person. And, and that worked for a little while, but then it, it, it became a, a bigger problem as the, um, the deal went on. As it went on, it, it became a bigger deal. So it just became a, let's get this floor off, let's move, let's keep just getting people. <clears throat> or we were working some of the areas we were literally digging with how the concrete was weakened um, besides for our, our normal like breach and breaking equipment we were using small like gardening shovels in that too so because that how stuff was breaking apart I mean it was so fragile um, like hands and knees bucket brigades just to get the material off um, when we were doing some of the targeted searches so it was a variety of equipment from your hands in a bucket to you know a big 80 pound breaker it just varied this here just kind of gives an idea of 80 units 79 units that were destroyed in the collapse overall at the end of it there there were 96 people that 96 or 98 people that that perished in the collapse um, and there were like one or two maybe three people that got out that were able to actually escape. So this is the dining hall. Um, like I said, the the staff of the of the ship took care of us. It wasn't a cruise. Like we didn't get cruise food. No, we didn't get cruise food. It was food. still good. It was good, it was and they good. took care of us, but we didn't get to enjoy the the cruise life, if you would. <laughs> that was my first I, time on a cruise. You know, and, <laughs> so. and all, yeah, mine too. In all actuality, we got back to the ship, and it was probably about two thirty, and you felt the you felt the ship moving. Well, the mooring line that was holding us to dock it actually broke, the and we were yeah. we were drifting out and away. So it was kind of. We did get to go on like a two-minute cruise, but <laughs> um, they took care of us. As you can see on the Fourth of July, they 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 really did. They they went above and beyond. The the staff did. Um, our, they did our laundry the whole time. We would we would give them our laundry that we needed. Um, they would take care of our laundry in a, in a day and get it back to us. This was our escape um, on a on a handful of the nights. We would get up on the top deck and just take it all in. They had a, a fireworks show on the 4th of July. We got to enjoy that. And then here's the complete Ohio team that went. Um, there's a picture of this, at, I'm pretty sure, over at Admin, and then the captains have a picture in their office as well, I'm trying to find a good place to put it. Um, yeah, it was, a, it, it was a, an experience, um, but like I said, it was related, you know, it was relatable to the 9-11, which hopefully, you know, knock on wood, I hope I never have to, you know, do this again, but I will if need be. Um, other than that, if you guys have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer questions. If not, um, I'm going to thank you for allowing us to be on the task force. I want to extend thanks to Chief because um, Chief Vandenboss, from the day that we've that I've been on task force and even since I've been on Beaver Creek in 2008, he's went above and beyond as far as support for the task force. And we get a lot more support through Beaver Creek on the task force than a lot of guys on the team do. And I, I thank you very much. I thank you guys for supporting us and, and, and know that we go out there. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know, you didn't tell me. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't remember. Had a brain fart there for a minute. So, what was, what was the age of that building? Um, um, uh, uh, 70s, 60s, somewhere around there. Yeah. Was, there did so anybody go in and pre-scan for you guys for asbestos and? I mean, who, so we did have we did have air monitoring okay. uh, the whole time. We were actually when we were on the pile. So we had N95s the whole time we were on deployment. But then when we were at the pile, it started out as sole APR, P100 filters, and then they did air monitoring on both sides of the building. We had a staging area on one side. So how they kind of split it up was we had all of our tools. Um, Sunbelt Rental came in and dumped everything they had within like a 100-mile radius in this pile. So we had access to everything. Well, they ended up then divvying it up to where it was, you know, like the Bravo side, Charlie side, or 
uh, Delta side, and so we had two different tool caches, and they had air monitoring on both sides. We actually have a report. I never even thought to put it in there. Um, we got a report back from the air quality of that event, and, and it was pretty informative, and they said that if you feel like you wanted to do kind of like what the task force or what, um, what they did with 9-11, where go in and get Fantastic. health scan and that you could be monitored and, and yeah, what similar happened. rubble. Yeah. But yeah, so, so yeah, we were, we were in um, APRs, P100s, the whole time we were near the pile. I thought I had pictures. I thought I had a couple pictures in there of, of the pile with, with us in those, but. Uh, the backs, must not. I think yeah. the backs were too. Yeah. So. Could you both re-identify yourselves, please, for those that are listening at home? Uh, oh, Lieutenant yeah. Ransdale, B platoon. Brian Hedrick, A platoon. Thank you. Well, we totally support Task Force One and everything you all have done. And thank you so much for giving us a presentation and those uh, taxpayers also that are watching to, to see how great our fire department is and yeah. our, the attitude of our people. So, yeah. thank, you. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have uh, no old business, new business. Thank you, board. Uh, first item is on page 17 of your packet as a proclamation uh, for one of our residents uh, who's in the Girl Scouts. Um, there is going to be a ceremony. I have two copies here. Uh, one is for the resolution book, uh, so that's a one page front and back, and then uh, the actual proclamation. You can pass it as presented. to approve resolution 20220228 admin E and a proclamation in honor of Paige McNaghton, Girl Scout Gold Award, as presented. Second. Trustee Crux? Yes. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Wallace? Yes. And I will be going to that um, event on Sunday and we will present the proclamation at that time. Thank you, board. Uh, next item is on page 19 of your pack as the bi-weekly report for the sheriff's office. Sergeant Moore is here to answer any questions. Any awareness items, uh, Sergeant Moore, as far as anything coming up that we need to be thinking of? No, sir. Uh, met today with uh, um, Mr. Kepler over at uh, Ankeny Soccer Fields, and so we're just kind of uh, prepping for how that might look with the new interchanges, <clears throat> and uh, we'll be speaking to ODOT representatives to make sure that we're in, a, in, in as good a situation as we can be uh, when that time comes. First round. No, uh, no pun intended. I, I, assume, I assume we'll get better as time goes. No pun intended. <laughs> Thank you, board. Uh, next item is on page 39 of your packet. It's a bi weekly report for HR. Are there any questions? I had no questions. I had none. I had nothing. Thank you. Thank you, board. Next item is on page 42. I'll turn it over to staff to go over the uh, first item, which is the Safe Routes to Schools uh, local match for a grant. So, Mr. McConnell's here. Answer, go over the resolution, the application process, and answer any questions. Thank you, board. Um, so, yes, in front of you, uh, we have a resolution that, um, so you passed a resolution at your last meeting that adopted the school transportation plan, which is the document that kind of, uh, you know, shows the overall plan, right? This resolution is for um, actually applying this year 
for state routes to school or safe routes to schools funding uh, from the state of Ohio. Um, and it also uh, uh, shows that we are willing to kind of contribute as well um, to a local match portion. So working with the Green County engineer, what we kind of came up with for local match percentages is Green County Parks and Trails is going to do 36,000. Beaver Creek School System is going to do 36. And so we're going to contribute, um, hopefully 20,000 is what we're asking from you to contribute to this project. So the overall total project cost is a $436,000, I believe, and some change. Um, so it's a small portion, but it is uh, crucial that we provide a local match when we do these grant applications. They look a lot better. Um, so that's what's in front of you. I'd be glad to answer any questions we have. Um, we're going to apply. Actually, we uh, have a meeting tomorrow, so we hope to finish up applications then once we have everybody's resolutions. Um, and we should uh, know later in the year whether or not this uh, project was funded. We're actually going to apply for two different projects, um, the main one being a section of road, uh, or rather multi-use path along Dayton Xenia in front of the school, and then also some walking paths that go from that path up to the school doors. And then the, additionally, the other project is um, some of that same walking path on Dayton Xenia across uh, Ankeny. So you know, Ankeny is a pretty important crossing, mm -hmm. um, crossing that and going on towards the neighborhoods over to the west. So. Uh, like I said, I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. I just appreciate all that you've done on this, Max. Uh, getting this forward and going through the schools and the city and making sure that this is gets completed. I appreciate that. Thank you. It was a it was a effort. Everybody involved, you know, we from the county engineer, the schools, state highway patrol, even local residents as well who have an interest in the project. So this really was a team effort. Just glad to be a part of it. Any other questions or comments? Uh, just uh, we don't have to budget for it this year, so we will be budget. You'll see it in next year's budget as a an allocation, uh, and it will be coming from the capital improvement fund. Um, there's also a motion on page 43 um, to approve the resolution. Thank you, board. Thank you. I make a motion to approve. Resolution number 2022-0214-CBR-A, um, authorizing the Greene County Engineer to submit an application to the Safe Routes to School program through the Ohio Dar Department of Transportation for the Beaver Creek City Schools project. Second. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Krebs? Yes. Trustee Walsh? Yes. Thank you, board. Next time on. Hope so. Uh, next item is on page 47 is the biweekly report and uh, Fire Marshal Grogen is here to answer any questions. Trustees, unfortunately Max walked out, but I wanted to thank Max for, uh, for all his effort that he's uh, done with Safe Routes to School. And then also uh, just uh, kind of apologize, Max is having a little uh, family issue, unfortunately, so we did not get uh, an update to the uh, build out data. We'll do that for the next meeting. Uh, nor did uh, Max get a chance to put his activity report in, but uh, we'll have an update uh, at the next meeting. And just as a, uh, an update, Carolyn has been working fantastic. She's uh, gotten, uh, gotten into a rhythm in the office and is, uh, is doing great for us. So thank you. Any comments? Good enough. I don't. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to thank, please thank Lori for us. Um, for her going through the cabinets and the drawers to, um, and taking that project on. Uh, she didn't have to, but appreciate her wealth of knowledge and uh, history so that she can ferret out things that are necessary to scan and things are not. It's important that she took that on because we would have been scanning a lot of things that were not necessary, so it's appreciative. Absolutely. I'll let her know. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, board. Next item is on page 55 of your packet. It's a bi weekly report for IT. Are there any questions? I had none. I had no questions, but I did want to appreciate the fact that their, their, pack, their workstation patching is, percentages are moving up quite nicely. Alex, um, do you know, um, does the township? pay for the Office 365 licensing in advance? 
on an annual basis or on a month to month basis. I'll have to look into that. The reason I ask is that um, as of midnight tonight, if you run a monthly, um, the fee goes up uh, 15%, and then there's a 20% monthly surcharge. If you pay in advance, you save both of those, and they lock in the rate for one year. Yeah, I'll double check. And that's on up to a 300 license package that I'm aware of. So it may there may be something there to just double check that. Yeah, I'll, I'll look into that. Um, also, we you know we have two levels. We have a many of our employees are under the education okay. package, uh, and um, and then there are other positions within the township that are not. So okay. we have two different kind of. Might just look at that. Yeah, if it was. Yep. There's a, a P1 for active directory licenses. The same thing. Okay. If, if the township's already on annual billing, then it doesn't matter. So. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? No. Thank you, board. Next item's on page 57 of your packet. It's the biweekly report for the finance department. Terry's on here to answer any questions. Are any questions from the board? I had no questions. I had none. Thank you for all you do, sir. Yeah, thank you for such an extensive report. Yes. You're awesome. Very nice. Thank you. And for making Ryan look good. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciate that. <laughs> there, for sure. It's great. Thank you, board. Next item is on page 60 of your packet. is the biweekly report for the road department. Are there any questions? Mr. Parks is here to answer any questions. Mr. Parks, at least this week should be no salt going down. Uh, hopefully no salt, no rain. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask about uh, all that rain with all the erosion checks? <laughs> um, <Yeah. clears throat> Mr. Parks, have we seen any issues as far as erosion from the MI development on uh, Alpha Bellbrook coming down on the factory? that are causing any issues uh, down there? No. No, no, we have not. Good. There's a pretty good buffer there. There's a lake. And actually, <laughs> yeah. 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 actually most of staying on the MI property yeah. at this point, so. Okay, I just make sure it didn't, ca that the flow of that didn't defeat any of the good work that you had done on, on our side of factory, essentially, so. Oh, no, and it's coming from the same place. Okay. Um, as all three of the road closures are, even the work we've done on Valley, um, and the work we've done off Valley back in the river has actually helped, because um, it used to be almost a number one closure right after factory, but now it's back to number three. So, good. we're helping it along. Of course, that, that section will also be out of the floodplain as soon as the interchange is completed. And as an informational item, just so you know, we found out today we did not get the ODOT grant for paving for this coming year. What's However, the, budget, still, what's the yeah. budget impact of that? If we, we did not, uh, did we budget for the grant or budget? I'll let Tim answer that. Oh, uh, we budgeted without the grant, right? But it'll be about a hundred thousand dollars. Um, that we're gonna end up paying out of pocket, and that was the worst road in the neighborhood. We actually submitted 11 projects, and they came back and said, cut it down to one. We cut it down to this one, um, and they came back with, we didn't score quite well enough, but there were upwards of, I want to say 2,000 projects that were submitted. Oh, geez. That's a lot. 
and the pool of money was only five million. So luckily we went ahead and budgeted for it. So yeah. we're going to take care of it, and get that neighborhood back in shape. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Park. Stay, stay safe out there. Thank you, board. Next item is on page 61 of your packet. It's the bi-weekly report for the fire department. Chief's here to answer any questions. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. <laughs> is there anything I can answer for you? Actually, uh, one point um, in the packet, uh, I did add a new chart. Um, it's a column chart in the uh, annual section, uh, just to give you a sense of where the uh, where the call volume is at year over year, in addition to the year to date. So um, it looks like we're kind of creeping up over similar to the past three. I shouldn't say the past three. If you go pre-pandemic, there were three years that we had substantial growth. We seem to be following that track again. So we had the pandemic knocked us down and then we're in that growth uh, stage. So it looks like this could be a record breaking year for us as far as calls, or at least it will be in one of our busiest historical years. So of course it's early in the year, so there's plenty of time for that to change. My emergency physician son says that people are not afraid to go to the ER again. <laughs> <laughs> They've gotten over that now. <laughs> I, I think our numbers kind of bear that out as well. Um, and then if there weren't any questions, I had one point I wanted to make, um, and they showed an interesting slide with the, uh, the N95 mask fit testing. And we've heard a lot about masks over the past couple of years. Um, but what they pointed out is an important thing. A lot of people would use N95s incorrectly and an N95 incorrect is just like any other mask. So uh, to properly wear it, it does have to be fit tested. Um, it does have to be fully sealed. Um, and that was the purpose of putting the bags on the head. They have like a, uh, an odor that if you, what he, the Lieutenant Ransdell didn't finish saying is if you can smell the odor, your mask doesn't fit properly and you have to adjust it until you don't smell that. So uh, for folks at home, if they do want to properly fit test, I don't know what the regulations are about putting bags over your head, <laughs> but it is part of the yeah, legitimate test. And up, don't try this at <laughs> <laughs> Yes, um, there, there is a very specific method to, to do it appropriately, and obviously they were under direct supervision doing that, but um, it, just putting the mask on in and of itself does not give you the full benefit. Thank you. So. Thank you, board. The bag would help, but not for long. <laughs> not for long, that's correct, sir. <laughs> Well, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chief. <laughs> okay. Our legal advisor, any comments? No. Nothing today. Thank you. Our fiscal officer, Mr. Rushing. Thank you, Board. Just one resolution this evening. Um, this resolution is to authorize the township by policy to uh, have what's known as employee dishonesty and faithful performance of duty coverage in lieu of surety bonds. This came about back in 2018. The state legislature through House Bill 291 uh, changed the statute in terms of the bonding requirements for public officials. As the board is aware, the elected officials of a township are required to hold a bond as well as any uh, fiscal officer or uh, finance department employees have to maintain a bond. The exception to that are those, any other individuals of the township, uh, individuals who <coughs> deal with cash, uh, be it you know, through planning and zoning <coughs> or other offices that handle um, cash or other financial resources, they're not required by statute in order to hold a bond. The state legislature, through many of the statewide associations, OTA, County Commissioners Association, Ohio Municipal League, worked on a bill, House Bill 291, to amend the statute to allow townships, cities, uh, et cetera, to uh, solicit the coverage of employee dishonesty and faithful performance of duty. What this essentially allows us to do is gives us the option. Otarmar presented this in terms of a renewal 
to add this additional coverage and present it to staff uh, to review. Uh, our intention is to add employees who are not bonded, but also the employees who are bonded, but deal with financial resources to be named under this coverage so that if not only the typical things such as, uh, for lack of a better term, non-feasance, misfeasance, or malfeasance, but also simply mistakes. Uh, bonds do not cover mistakes such as somebody giving back bad change or other mechanisms whereas this insurance policy would cover uh, mistakes as that as well. If the board is inclined, we have to adopt this uh, policy in order to have the uh, statutory uh, obligation to provide this coverage to these employees um, that we identify to be to deal with financial resources. So this policy um, is presented to us by Otarmer. It's a, a boilerplate um, resolution that they prepared um, provide to us, and for those who may not know, Otama is our township property and liability insurance carrier. Can you explain number five? <clears throat> what this entails is that uh, certain elected officials prior to taking office have to be considered able to take office and part of the requirements to take office is to be bondable. However, if the township does require um, the employee dishonesty or faithful performance of duty coverage, they have to be insurable for lack of a better term. Okay. So it's not a, you're not a, so our elected officials and, and or assistant to fiscal officer, those positions, are they still going to be bonded or they're no longer going to be bonded? Um, the you can have both bonds and be covered under the insurance policy. Okay. Uh, my recommendation may be up to the individual, but the elected officials to maintain their bond as well as um, be covered on this policy. Okay. And then, so the the coverage is similar to do you know? Correct. The coverage has to be equal to or greater than what the statute provides for bonds. So as Beaver Creek Township is a top tier township in terms of budget, they rate townships in terms of budget size. So we are over the 10 million, which is the highest tier. Uh, the fiscal officer has to maintain a $250,000 bond. Um, so any coverage for myself or other elected officials has to be equal to or greater than that dollar amount. But as far as, so errors and omissions, it does cover that? Correct. Sure. Uh, so, for example, the board has required me to carry a bond. Um, we have a position in the community development risk, and then, of course, the three positions um, in the uh, finance department. So, uh, what will be nice with this, if the board elects to keep a bond, then the rest of us can move under the insurance policy, and then we can add additional employees at no additional cost. So, um, so we plan to add some. Well, I guess I was asking, why would you? Why would you do both? Why wouldn't you just do this only? It'll be up to you as an individual. Just from a cost standpoint. Yeah. For for staff, it makes absolute sense to go from bond to this. Uh, for the elected officials, it'll be a, a, you know, up mm -hmm. to each of you individually to make that decision. Okay. Some townships have completely, some elected officials have chosen to go with the, the insurance policy as opposed to bond. Any other questions? There's a resolution on page 66. It could be uh, adopted as presented. <coughs> I'll make a motion to approve resolution number 2022-228-FIN-A, uh, Beaver Creek Township Trustees, a resolution authorizing employee dishonesty and faithful performance of duty coverage in lieu of surety bonds as presented. Second. Trustee Kretz? Yes. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Walsh? Yes. Thank you, board. That's all I have this evening. Thank you. Went into our meeting assignments. MVRPC meets on Thursday um, based on the agenda. Uh, the US 35 in Trayvine is number one on the list for MVRPC for Green County. Uh, technical Advisory commi Committee. No report. Regional Planning. Nothing to report. Health Department. Meeting is this Thursday. 
six thirty. Okay. School superintendent, city manager. Thank you, board. Um, I did meet with the city manager last week. Uh, I was definitely off for a week because of the short month. <laughs> I was expecting all my meetings, monthly meetings, to be this week. Um, we did talk about uh, several projects, um, both related to uh, using the ARPA funds, both in the city uh, as well as the township. Um, we also talked about um, you know, the upcoming levy in regards to uh, income tax uh, for the city of Beaver Creek. Um, and then uh, we started to discuss an agenda uh, for the joint meeting in April. So um, probably uh, the second meeting of March, we'll have an agenda uh, to review uh, on the agenda for the regular trustee meeting uh, for the joint meeting. Uh, if you have any suggestions or any topics you want to talk about, just uh, email me then and then I'll get with the city manager. Um, both the city manager and I will also be attending the uh, Ohio City County Managers Association um, this year, uh, as well as the uh, International uh, Association of City Managers and County Administrators. I guess you can show them township administrators in there somewhere. Uh, that'll be hosted in Columbus as well, so you know, I'm not traveling very far this year. Uh, and it'll be our first in person since uh, obviously COVID. Um, and the last thing I did uh, have uh, some discussions with the superintendent to talk about a uh, uh, joint meeting. It's uh, school's turn to host. Um, we are looking at two dates this summer, Thursday, June 16th, or July 14th, which is also a Thursday, at their location starting at 630. June 16th, you said? June 16th or July 14th. You want us to get back to you on that? You can. Yeah, personally. Could you all email him then? Or if you have a, if you can say now. I, my calendar's at home. I, don't, I couldn't tell you. Okay, that's fine. that's fine. Those are the two dates I'll follow up with uh, uh, either at the next meeting or if you email me, I'll um, make sure that the rest of this, I like the, the elected officials. Of What's July. that? I said I like the 14th of July. <laughs> It doesn't matter, but. Okay. And then once again, if you have any agenda items, let me know. Um, and I'll be working with the superintendent on uh, that. And then uh, next item would be the uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Restoration Advisory Committee. We do have a meeting that's going to be uh, on teens um, on March 21st. It's open to the public. I don't know how Wright-Pat's going to do that, but... Um, it's uh, for them to work out all the logistics, and they'll be at 6 o'clock. So I'll be providing additional information uh, after that meeting. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Green County Township Association, we have our meeting March 8th, next week, next Tuesday. Please, if you decide to go, the city a county engineer would like an RSVP. She will be hosting. Investment Oversight Committee? Nothing more than what we heard today. Board, I recommend taking a recess to the public hearing. We will take a 35 minute recess and be back. Okay, um, all parties have agreed to start early, so it's 6 16, and we're going to go ahead and start with our um, hearing. We are here today to conduct a hearing pursuant to Ohio Revised Code Section 505.38 and 733.35-733.39. Charges were presented to this board on February 14, 2022, and as such, the matter is to be heard at the next regular meeting, which is today. No continuance has been requested. The procedures for the hearing will be as follows. If the parties choose, they may make a brief opening statement or they may waive any statement. We will start with the township and then go to Mr. Collins or his representative. After any opening statement, the township will proceed with its presentation in the hearing and may call any witnesses it chooses to call and present its evidence. Mr. Collins will have an opportunity to cross-examine any witnesses that are presented. Once the township has completed the presentation of its side, 
it will be Mr. Collins' opportunity to respond to the charges, call any witnesses, and present any evidence to the board. The township will have an opportunity to cross-examine any witnesses if necessary. The township may present any rebuttal witnesses if necessary. The Board of Trustees is not required to strictly follow the Ohio Rules of Evidence. The parties may then make a brief closing statement, starting with the township and then Mr. Collins. The Board will then go into executive session to deliberate. The Board may issue a decision this evening or may take the matter under advisement. Are there any questions about the procedures? If not, we will get started. Uh, Township waves an opening statement. I'll wave mine. Mr. Collins is waving his opening statement. Okay, the Township, Mr. Hansbaum will present its evidence. I'd like to call David Vandebos, please. Chief, I'm going to ask you a few questions. We're going to introduce a few documents uh, this evening. Can you, I, everyone knows who you are, so we're going to, we'll start, um, forego the introductions here. Um, can you describe briefly uh, the issue that brought us here tonight? Yes, sir. Um, I believe it was January 9th. I don't have the paper in front of me. Um, uh, Mr. Collins' uh, certifications expired. they are state certifications for firefighter and for paramedic. Uh, the next morning he notified his supervisor that they had expired, uh, putting us on notice um, and uh, began the process of renewing those certifications. We verified that they had indeed expired um, and awaited his uh, getting them renewed and once they were renewed um, we verified that they had been. Uh, we made the board aware that night, the 10th if I recall uh, correctly, uh, they directed me to prepare charges based off of uh, the um, certifications failing, uh, which I did and presented, and I believe that's the document that you probably have. Okay, let's go back to the certification. What What is the specific certification that was inactive? There are two that are ex directly relevant, and then there was a third that was in that mix. Uh, the first is the firefighter, professional firefighter, firefighter level two certification. That is the certification that allows uh, a member to perform duties as a firefighter. Um, there was a uh, paramedic, MT paramedic certification. Uh, that is what allows the member to uh, provide emergency medical services as a paramedic. Um, there was also a fire safety inspector, if I recall correctly, um, but that's not directly related to uh, job requirement. How often do those have to be renewed? Every three years on the, uh, on the certified member's birthday. And what's the process for renewal? Um, you get a series of reminders from the state, and uh, there's, a, I believe, a couple uh, processes. There's a mail-in option, uh, but the most direct and the one that most people use um, is uh, an online. You go, you log into the state's uh, certification uh, website. Uh, you put in the acknowledgement that you have the uh, correct number of continuing education hours that are required. Uh, a few other uh, declarations um, that basically you're legally allowed to hold the certification and then you submit the, the uh, request for recertification. And it's essentially an automatic, once you click that, uh, submit button. Okay. How long does that process take? Um, if all of the work is done ahead of time and the, cert, the continuing ed is complete, um, about five minutes. Okay, and it's the employee who, is it the employee or the employer who's responsible for that the entire employee. process? Say that again. The employee. Okay. You mentioned that um, you became aware of this from Firefighter Collins. Can you describe uh, that conversation? Actually, I, I became aware of it through the chain of command. So uh, my understanding is he notified his direct supervisor. His direct supervisor notified the uh, division chief of operations. The division chief of operations notified me. Did you ultimately have a conversation with Firefighter Collins about this? Yes, sir. Okay, and tell me about that. Um, we had a... Uh, 
pretty in-depth conversation, asked him what had happened. He described uh, essentially that he had started the process, got interrupted or had stopped, and did not go back to complete it. Um, because it is on people's birthday, I'm assuming is why it keyed in the next morning that he recalled that it had not been done and made the notifications. Um, he expressed, uh, he took ownership of it. He expressed that it was on him and his responsibility, he did not complete it. He immediately began the process to, uh, to renew the certifications. Um, I think it was later that uh, day, the 10th, or it was early on the 11th perhaps, he had all the uh, packet of information together to submit to the state and did so, um, and then just waited on the state to fulfill that. Okay, I'm gonna hand you a document and then I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. Glad I brought my glasses. Do you recognize this document? Yes, sir. Can you tell us what it is? It is the uh, printed verification from the state uh, that his certifications are currently active after a period of inactivity. Okay. Has Firefighter Collins been subject to past discipline during his period of employment with the township? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what was the result of that discipline? The uh, most significant discipline and the one that uh, weighed into this uh, process is uh, he ended up uh, with a last chance agreement uh, for a uh, driving violation about a year, a little over a year ago. Okay. I'm going to hand you another document and then ask you some questions. <clears throat> Do you recognize that document? Yes, sir, I do. Can you tell me what that is? This is the last chance agreement uh, from the uh, driving violation from October of uh, 2020. Okay. Considering the, the circumstances of the violation, considering the past behavior of Firefighter Collins, um, do you have a recommendation on behalf of township administration with respect to a level of discipline? Unfortunately, um, this, these are both major issues, major breaches of, of trust and responsibility with the organization. So uh, while I don't have a specific recommendation, um, I believe that it does need to send a message that uh, behavior needs to be appropriate, that the core responsibilities of maintaining certifications and responsibility towards employment need to be uh, be honored. So um, I would think it's it's going to be more than a, a reprimand. It probably needs to be a suspension or termination. It, it raises to that level, especially now we have a pattern of behavior. I have no additional questions for the chief and the township has no additional witnesses. So we rest our case. Thank you very much. Mr. Collins, would you like to present evidence to the board? <coughs> cross examine. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. He can cross -examine. Examine. You want to cross examine? Yeah, I mean, all the information is there. So. Okay. Would you like to make a presentation to the board? Uh, my name is Robert Collins. So as the fire chief stated, I, uh, my recertification period was January 9th. I failed to submit my renewal forms for um, renewal of my fire, paramedic, and fire safety inspector cards. <clears throat> I realized Monday morning, uh, about 45 minutes into my shift, it, it was... <laughs> I, I just forgot to do it, slipped my mind, I had all the hours required, um, but I, I did not get online and fill out the form. 
I have no excuse for it. I mean, it's like they said, it takes about five minutes to do. It's not hard. So um, it's just something that slipped my mind for that weekend. And uh, that's really about it. There's not a whole lot else to it. So, so that's all I have for that. You want to call any witnesses? to move to executive session. So moved. Second. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Kretz? Yes. Trustee Wallace? Yes. Just, just to add, it's going to be for um, section oh, one sorry. to <coughs> G1 to consider the dismissal or, or discipline of a public employee or the investigation of charges or complaints against a public employee. Second with discussion, though, made a comment that's the first time I've heard that this evening, that you discovered this 45 minutes into your shift? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. You want to take another vote and we'll do it corrected? Yeah. You want me to read the whole thing? Call. Call the vote. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Kretz? Yes. Trustee Wallace? Yes. make a motion to come out of the executive session return to meeting second trustee Dean yes trustee Kretz yes trustee Wallace yes I make a motion to find that Bobby Collins is guilty of charge one non-feasance for failing to maintain his certifications as required as a condition of employment second with the discussion um, board, we had a last chance agreement uh, that uh, was entered into on the 23rd of October 2020, and section four of that agreement <coughs> essentially said the employee understands that he signs this agreement to preserve his employment. He recognizes the reasons for it and agrees to conduct himself appropriately. The employee understands and agrees that any future misconduct regarding violations of either the employee's driving policy or notification requirement will result in his immediate termination from employment. In addition, employee will still be subject to all other rules and regulations of the township, and any violation of which may also result in the employee's termination. To ensure that the employee is adhering to the employee's policies, the employee agrees to submit to random drug and alcohol testing at the discretion of the em employer for a period of six months. The employee understands he'll be required to undergo at least six um, other drug and alcohol tests during this period of time at his own expense. Um, the definition, obviously, of nonfeasance, <clears throat> failure to perform an act that is required by law. And so um, a condition, Mr. Zaharia, if, uh, it's a condition of employment to essentially uh, be certified or maintain your certification. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And then um, okay. Uh, the concerning one major concerning piece, I guess, and I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you being honest. Um, but one concerning piece of it is the. The 45-minute lag, because that was that was not understood. At least I did not understand that to be true. I understood that you re you realized it before you came on shift, and that um, the township was notified. And so I don't know if it was your lieutenant or your captain, or if that was missed, or um, when that was communicated. But somehow, one way or another, like I said, we were under understanding that it was you caught it before you came on shift. Obviously, had you gone on a call, had you pushed an IV or pushed drugs, um, we would have, this entire township would have had a major problem, um, as well as your chain of command. So, um, 
<clears throat> you know, from a township perspective, obviously, um, you know, it kind of puts township board, you know, between a rock and a rock. Um, what's the definition of last chance if it's not a last chance? You know, on the flip side, um, everybody in this room is human and, and mistakes happen. So the challenge obviously is when you make a mistake and um, you screw up somebody's life over it um, or you screw up your own so or your family's. And so, But I think at the end of the day, you know, we've got an agreement that was signed and everybody knew what the agreement meant. And I think had uh, had you gone on a call, it would have been gross neglect of duty and nonfeasance, 100%. Um, and it could be argued probably that it's it's both now, but I think nonfeasance is the best one that fits. So, Ms. Frick, you know, there's language in this agreement in Section Four that I read that essentially says, you know. Uh, will result in the immediate termination of employment. And then there's a second section that says, that's a, essentially, I guess if I interpret this correctly, um, that's tied dominantly, I guess, to the, the OBI issue. Um, Red, I think, um, I mean, it's pretty clear that it, this is a driving policy um, or notification requirement, which in that situation there was a requirement for notification to the township for the prior incident, that that would be, it will result in immediate termination. Um, and there is some legal significance to the wording there, as well as um, the next line, which That's is- That's headed with may. Yes, which does provide that um, it may result, other violations of rules and regulations may result in termination, but it does allow for some flexibility, I guess, or um, depending some discretion, I guess is the better word, depending on what you're looking at in terms of right. um, the violation. If there was a violation of the driving policy, we'd be obligated to essentially terminate. I believe so, yes. If there's a violation of any other rule or policy, then we have the option to terminate or to discipline. Yes. Is that how, okay, just for clarification. Okay, and then as far as the, um, like I said, the, the challenge, obviously the, the rock in the rock is um, setting a precedent that I think if, as long as we, rel if we rely upon the fact that this was not a driving violation um, and we opt then to make a recommendation for um, discipline, Essentially, it's it's a um, you know do we start it you know thirty days, twenty days, ten days? I don't know what this board thinks is uh, as far as a, how many shift days would be adequate to to ex as at least make everyone aware and understand the gravity of the situation that it is important, um, or or do we move you know right to the termination? What's the, what's the, what do you guys think? Any discussion? Go ahead. Um, I, I think it has to be a significant amount of uh, discipline if it's not going to be a termination to, you know, um, make a statement and you know that it's a serious allegation and that the behavior can't continue. I agree with that. Um, I, think that have had, I think the confusing part I had was the 45 minutes. Um, had, a, had you walked in and a call had come in at that moment in time, would you have, had, you know, would you have remembered on the call? Or now that in, a call didn't come in and you had the time, that, that point right there was significant for 
everyone here in the room and our entire township with the legality of not being certified on a call. So that, that was critical. But the fact that you turned around and, and did report it, did not hold back, did not make any excuses, um, I feel is worthy of more discipline than termination. Alex Adon or Ms. Frick, are we, are we able to ask um, Mr. Collins something on the record? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Just, if you want to come on up just real quick. Thanks. Are you absolutely certain that you did not go on any call um, while your certifications were lapsed? Yes, I am certain. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And, and board, just so for clarification, is it any action that you take if, if you choose to do something in lieu of termination? It doesn't um, eliminate or remove the terms that he is still currently obligated under the last chance agreement. So that still is in place for three years from the date of the signature of the agreement, October 23rd, 2020. Okay. Okay. And as far as the number of days, I don't, like I said, I, I don't know what you're going to do. I, I'm fine with it, 10 shift days um, without pay, if that makes sense. 10? And that does not take into account any shift days that have already been missed. That would be 10, 10, 10 shift days from today. So you have to vote on the uh, motion in place from the malfeasance. Or the malfeasance. Oh, yeah. Non-feasance. Non 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 any further discussion? Trustee no. Dean? Yes. Trustee Kretz? Yes. Trustee Wallace? Yes. Um, based upon the findings that you are guilty of the charge of non-feasance um, in lieu of termination, I make a motion to suspend firefighter paramedic Collins for 10 shift days without pay. Second, with clarification that, again, that there is uh, the existing agreement stays in place until the expiration of the full. Okay. Yes. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Kretz? Yes. Trustee Wallace? Yes. Or that's all we have, so just a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Trustee Dean? Yes. Trustee Kretz? Yes. Trustee Wallace? Yes.